Hi everyone, and welcome to Shukin Science. In this video, we'll talk about the basics of the female reproductive anatomy, beginning with the site of gametogenesis. Now, the female gamete is of course the egg. And eggs are produced inside of these structures here, known as ovaries. And unlike males who continuously produce sperm cells throughout their entire lives beginning at puberty, females are actually born with all the eggs that they will ever have inside of these ovaries. However, beginning at puberty, one of these eggs will go through a maturation process and will eventually leave the ovaries through a process called ovulation. And that is where they could potentially encounter a sperm cell, become fertilized, and eventually implant to form an embryo. So we're actually going to zoom into this ovary here to take a look at what exactly is happening in there during that egg maturation process. So like I said, once a month beginning at puberty, one of the eggs inside of these ovaries is going to mature. And that takes place within a cluster of cells known as follicles. So follicles are all these loopy kind of black parts of the tissue that surround the pink egg. So the egg is this pink little dot inside. And Follicles are essentially supportive cells. They help to secrete hormones that allow the egg inside of them to mature. So throughout the menstrual cycle, you can start to see a cluster of follicles developing, getting bigger and bigger, and inside of them, an egg is maturing and getting ready for ovulation. That's this process that you're seeing here. When that egg is mature, the follicles will actually rupture. The egg will then push against the membrane of the ovaries and then first out of the ovaries into the next structure, the fallopian tubes. And again, it's at that point where it could potentially meet a sperm cell. But that's not technically the end of the follicles. The follicles that were basically supporting that egg, they then turn into this structure here known as the corpus luteum. And if you have checked out my video on the menstrual cycle, you'll know that this structure, the corpus luteum, plays an essential role in maintaining the endometrial lining of the uterus to allow a pregnancy to potentially occur. But of course, if fertilization doesn't happen and nothing implants into that endometrial lining, the corpus luteum will eventually break down. It will stop secreting the hormones that maintain this lining. And then at the end of the cycle, the lining will be shed. So the process of follicle and egg maturation, ovulation, and then the formation and eventual breakdown of the corpus luteum, those processes are all taking place throughout a 28-day cycle known as the menstrual cycle. And if you want to know more about the hormones that regulate that process, check out my video on the menstrual cycle. Anyways, let's go back to this big picture here. So inside of the ovaries, that's where we see the eggs. And the ovaries are attached to the uterus through these kind of bands of cartilage, but they are technically not directly attached to the next structure, which are known as the fallopian tubes. Sometimes also known as oviducts. And so that's where these little finger-like projections at the end of the fallopian tube come in handy. These are known as fimbrae. And because the ovaries are not directly attached to the fallopian tubes, the fimbrae, once the egg is released or ovulated, basically act to sweep it up and increase the probability of that egg making its way into a fallopian tube. Once in a while, when an egg is ovulated, it ends up outside of the fallopian tube, which can be particularly dangerous because if it's fertilized out here, it can result in something called an ectopic pregnancy, which would put the mother's life at risk, unfortunately. So it would not be a viable pregnancy. So again, when the egg is ovulated, the fimbrae sweep it up, and then it enters the fallopian tube, which is the site of fertilization. Whether it's fertilized or not, that egg will continue moving and 
eventually it will enter this location here known as the uterus. And if that egg is fertilized, it's going to be undergoing a whole bunch of changes and it will eventually implant here into the uterine wall, which is also known as the endometrial lining. Now this wall or endometrial lining contains a rich supply of blood vessels to support an embryo if it does in fact implant and begin to develop. And if that were to happen, that would mark the beginning of pregnancy here, that implantation process. Now, this part of the uterus, kind of towards the bottom here, is referred to as the cervix. And it's this really tough muscular band of tissue that for the most part stays closed. And that's important during pregnancy because obviously it's going to help keep the developing fetus in the uterus. It's also important though during the last half of the menstrual cycle because that's going to help prevent another sperm cell from getting in and fertilizing another egg if it was to be ovulated. So the cervix can dilate, it can constrict, just depending on which part of the cycle a woman is in. And then the part leaving the uterus, if this egg was to implant and eventually become a fetus, that is the birth canal. That's the vagina or vaginal canal. And if it wasn't to implant, then that is also the location where that endometrial lining will be sloughed off at the end of the menstrual cycle. Um, so that is where menstruation actually takes place. It's also where sperm are deposited during sexual intercourse, and then they would eventually make their way through the uterus, through the fallopian tube, and hopefully find an egg. So at this point, I'm hoping you're starting to think of maybe some differences between the male and the female reproductive systems. Although in the grand scheme of things, they have a similar organization. There are some key differences that set them apart, namely that you'll notice I haven't labeled the urethra anywhere in this diagram. And that's because in females, the excretory system is completely separate from reproductive functions. So remember, in the male anatomy, the urethra carries both urine and semen out of the body. Now, women do have a urethra for carrying urine, but because it plays no role in reproduction, because they have a separate opening, the vaginal canal, for reproductive functions, then there's actually no need to include it in this diagram. So that's difference number one. Another key difference you may have noticed is that all of this anatomy that we've labeled here today is internal. You can't see any of this from the outside of the female body. Whereas obviously the male genitalia um, is externally visible, at least some of it, namely the testes and the penis. And that isn't to say that females don't have external genitalia. Of course they do. If we take a look at the opening to the vaginal canal, so if we kind of reorient ourselves instead of looking at a cross section this way, what we would see are several layers of protective tissue around the vagina. So it might look something like this. Now this entire structure, the entire external female anatomy is known as the vulva. And it does consist of some separate parts. Um, there's a band of tissue kind of towards the top of the vulva known as the clitoris contains really, really sensitive bundles of uh, nerve fibers. Um, we have the labia majora and the labia minora, which are essentially just folds around um, the vaginal canal here. And the purpose of those folds of tissue are to protect the vaginal canal from infection. What we would never want to see is bacteria make its way into the uterus or even into the ovaries because that could lead to serious infections. So the external female anatomy is important. It serves protective and pleasure functions. 
Um, but to be honest, they're not directly part of gametogenesis or part of supporting a pregnancy. And so although you should know them and know what they look like, um, you're not going to be asked to label them on one of our exams. All right, I hope that was helpful. Um, if you want to check out the process of oogenesis in a little bit more detail, then stay tuned for my next video. Thanks everyone.